Okay, good evening and welcome to the Costa Mesa City Council special meeting for Tuesday, March 17th at 6 p.m. Um, I'm gonna read this statement because of a unique situation we're under. On March 12th, 2020, Governor Newsom issued Executive Order N2520, which allows council members to attend city council meetings telephonically. Please be advised that some of the Costa Mesa City Council members are attending this meeting telephonically. In order to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 virus, please do the following. You are strongly encouraged to observe the City Council meetings live on Costa Mesa TV, Spectrum 3, and at AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and online at youtube.com forward slash Costa Mesa TV. If you choose not to attend the city council meeting, but wish to make a comment on a specific agenda item, please submit your comment via email by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, well, that's today and that already passed. You can still submit an email if you'd like to the city clerk at cityclerk at costamesaca.gov. If you're watching the live stream and wish to make either a general public comment or to comment on a specific agenda item as it is being heard, please submit your comment limited to 200 words or less to the city clerk at cityclerk at costamesaca.gov. Every effort will be made to read your comment into the record, but some comments may not be read due to time limitations. I think we, we don't have that many comments tonight, right? So we're okay. If you choose to attend the city council meeting in person, please note seating is limited. You will be required to maintain appropriate social distancing i.e. maintain a six foot distance between yourself and other individuals. For those who are already in the audience, you know that we have the blue tape marking off the seats to make sure that everyone is six feet from the other. If you are in the group of individuals who may be most vulnerable to COVID-19, including those over the age of 60 and those with underlying health conditions, including but not limited to lung, heart, immune compromised, diabetes, or other conditions that could interfere with your ability to fight COVID-19, please consider carefully before attending this meeting in person and for sure keep a six foot distance from others as much as possible. Save Costa Mesa thanks you in advance for taking all precautions to prevent spreading the COVID-19 virus. We are gonna have an update as to where we are now with regard to that. And um, at this time, should we, I know it says to do the, the roll later, but should we have the roll? Okay, let's have the roll now. <clears throat> Council Member Chavez. Present. Councilmember Gannis? Here. Councilmember Mansour? Here. Councilmember Marr? Here. Councilmember Reynolds? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens? Here. Mayor Foley? Present. Okay, uh, at this time we will have public comments related to items that are not on the agenda uh, as it relates to the special meeting. If you'd like to speak, please line up at one of the podiums. Um, each speaker will get three minutes. And what we would request is that you not touch the microphone or not touch the podium. It's just the world we're in right now. We're trying to minimize contacts and, and spread of, of the virus. Go ahead and come to the podium. This is Well, this, my script says not on the agenda, so could I get some clarity? On the yep. special meeting agenda, it will be just, just a special meeting agenda. Okay, so the special meeting agenda relates to discussion of emergency orders and potential need to ratify the emergency orders. And so um, normally, you know, they're not going to know what that is because we haven't presented it yet. You, Madam Mayor, you can you can elect to ask staff to give a brief report and then seek public comment. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Sorry. Not the screen. Concerned. Okay. So, um, yeah, go. this is all, we're all trying to evolve and uh, adjust and be flexible. Um, so, let's see. Okay. Ms. Farrell Harrison. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor Foley and council members and community. As you can imagine, this has been a very challenging week 
for our Costa Mesa community, our businesses, residents, and our city employees. The news about the coronavirus 19 uh, virus and its impacts is rapidly changing each day and at times can be very hard to keep up with. The Costa Mesa community is fortunate to have excellent leadership with our mayor and city council, our leadership team, and all of the staff that we have throughout the city, especially our public safety team and first responders who are working around the clock to keep essential services functioning. We continue to monitor the many directives and orders that are being issued from federal, state, and county leaders. Earlier this week, we followed the lead of Governor Gavin Newsom and urged the public and the business community to follow many different guidelines. In some cases, those guidelines have changed very quickly, sometimes from one hour to the next, sometimes from one day to the next. In order to be able to give you the best information that we can on a timely basis and for you to make intelligent decisions that are based in science and are in the best interest of the community, we felt that it was important to have a mechanism to add items to the agenda, such as the special meeting that we agendized for tonight that um, we needed to do after we had already posted the regular meeting agenda. So this evening, we would like for you to consider a number of items that have been brought to our attention that could provide additional relief to our residents and to the community while we go through the challenges that are being presented by coronavirus and the many measures that have been taking place. One of the measures that has taken place involves the closure of businesses. There are other measures that have involved school closures, all making it, um, all with the intent of creating more social distancing, more uh, home isolation, and encouraging people to be away from large social gatherings. What that means is that we'll have more residents um, staying in their homes and um, basically not being out and about as much, which could create certain impacts. And we want to make sure that nothing that we're doing at the city level is going to hurt the community um, anymore or create any more um, difficulties for them financially than some of the business closures and other things that are taking place. And so this evening, we are asking that you consider a number of items that we could offer to the community in order to reduce the financial impact to them and to show some leniency during this very difficult time. And so what we'd like for you to consider this evening is a couple of things, particularly related to parking impacts throughout the city now that we'll have so many more of our residents um, residing at home for longer periods of time. And so in particular, what we would like for you to consider is waiving some uh, fees and fines tonight, namely for st street sweeping uh, tickets for those to be waived for the community and also in the case of residential parking permits for us to be able to uh, not issue tickets if, um, you know, we have some congestion going on in the neighborhoods or we just have the ability for people to park without restriction. And so we ask for, on the street sweeping side, um, relief also for parking citations, uh, but um, in those limited instances as it relates to street sweep, sweeping and then for the residential parking permits. So those are two items that we're bringing forward this evening. There may be more upcoming. Um, we'll try to do regular updates to you um, within um, a reasonable period of time if we feel that we need to have additional relief that we can provide to our residents or clarification. So that concludes staff's report and we're available if you have any questions. Okay, um, tonight because we have council members on the um, telephone, I think what we're going to do is have the community comments and then we'll take questions. I think that might be easier. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, sir. Well, I'm a homeless Orange Coast Community College student, and the main reason I came here is because I know LA County has issued an edict calling for the blanket closure of the 24-hour fitness centers throughout the county. The city, um, I found out just a few hours ago that the 24-hour fitness on Wilson Street is gonna close at 10 for the foreseeable future. This, of course, unfortunately, is uh, not really an intelligent balancing of, uh, of risks. I can understand the thinking about the risk of uh, the gyms becoming a harbinger of the 
coronavirus. However, it has to be balanced against the risk of a homeless population in, or in Costa Mesa that relies upon those 24-hour fitness facilities for their for a bathroom and bathing and uh, and bathroom facilities. They are a potential disease vector. If you close off that up, that uh, uh, those washroom facilities, then you're creating much more hardship. Uh, this is a novel situation. We have never dealt with this before, and there clearly needs to be an intelligent balancing of risks. Um, and I, I would have to argue with you that the, uh, the picture disease vector from a homeless population that has been shut out of bathrooms um, and meeting areas like, like Starbucks so they can have access to internet and uh, charge their cell phones is uh, much more harmful. Now, Orange Coast Community College has closed off their facilities, including the food pantry that serves the entire community. It needs to be open, and the computing centers and the libraries need to be open, too. Um, we depend on the internet, not just to get our homework done and to submit it, but also as a lifeline, so we can charge our laptops and our telephones. And so I'm asking you to do two things, two things. One, contact Plant Fitness Corporate and get them to reopen the Costa Mesa facility on a 24-hour basis, but two, contact Orange Coast Community College and have them reopen the, uh, watch the uh, math business computing center, the library, and the pantry, and the associated restroom facilities there to homeless students, okay? Um, there is a potential yeah. risk involved, but uh, I think they need to trust their students, you know, to use some sort of discernment. But not my case, I'm homeless, I live in my car. And I, uh, you know, I don't have that choice. So Thank you, sir. I can use your help in that. Thank so you. If you can and maybe, um, Chief Stefano, you could give him information about our homeless shelter uh, and uh, how he can maybe possibly access the homeless shelter for showering, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I was just listening to the last speaker and was wondering the same thing, if there can't be some, some kind of facilities that would be open for the homeless, um, especially in the time of this coronavirus. And I want to thank you all for everything you're doing. And my concern is that, you know, things do go on. The planning commission is uh, due to go on. Will that be um, postponed at all? based on the coronavirus, because we have some really important issues coming up. One is the triangle signs that are um, about 2,600 square feet of signs on three corners of our very busy intersections. And I think, um, especially since we've had this from 2010, that something this important should uh, be postponed till the public can. As we can see now, there's only a matter of probably seven of us in here. And if this thing has the same input that it did last time in 2010, I think you'll know, remember, because you were on the council, um, Mayor Foley, that we had about 75 people here regarding that sign. So I certainly would hope that the Planning Commission could either postpone uh, this particular item or just completely postponed. They canceled the meeting about two weeks ago. So to have it an essential service, I think maybe we should question that for the uh, uh, for the basis of what's going on with the coronavirus. And everybody be safe. Thank you. Okay, we have no other public comments. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, please, Ms. Green, please read us. We have individuals who communicated to us in advance of the meeting. Thank you. And these items all are about COVID-19. Okay. Okay. First one is from Deborah Marsteller. Uh, I'd like to recommend setting up a call center to coordinate needs for vulnerable residents. People with disabilities and seniors can be paired with college kids or healthy community members willing 
to check on them daily. Two PPEs are needed for frontline staff and group homes, community-based residential and other organizations that would usually send people to the hospital. We may not have that luxury and should be prepared if we have to care for people with the virus in their home or small group homes. It will take the pressure off of hospitals. Three, we should make preparations for isolating people who are sick from people who are well. This will flatten the curve and again prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed. Four, prepared to set up drive-by testing ASAP. Thank you so much for your work. We are actually lucky in Costa Mesa because we have Fairview Developmental Center right here, and that may be a perfect place for isolation if prepared correctly. They are very busy giving away all their brand new pillow sheets, hospital beds, and other supplies right now. So maybe that should be slowed down temporarily. Thank you. The next one is from Mary K. Hill. I just want to thank Mayor Foley and everyone who worked swiftly, swiftly and tirelessly to prevent the use of FDC as a quarantine site. With that said, I feel that the public needs to be informed that extraordinary measures such as self-quarantine and lockdown may sound scary, but actually a good thing since those measures, while might seem scary, will slow down the infection rate. So if we ever get hit, it won't overwhelm the healthcare system overburden the medical professionals and first responders. I personally know there are still people who are complacent at best or think this is a hoax or worse. If people are not informed in order to take this seriously, we will pay for it. I know Uber driver who thinks this is an opportunity to make money and Ubers all day and night. The number of people hopping in and out of his vehicle equals to a crowd. I know many people need to make money, but to what end? In 1975, there was a wave of Vietnamese immigrants to California. A tent city for thousands was set up in Camp Pendleton, San Diego. I was one among them. We were, for all intents and purposes, quarantined for months before being sponsored out across the state. The government made sure we got screened, got necessary shots. It was made sure we didn't carry any infectious diseases such as TB and the likes. Maybe a similar model can be adapted if ever necessary. Thank you for allowing me to share. This one is from Masood Osman. A big thank you to our city and all team members, and I do mean all. Are there plans to introduce an emergency moratorium to halt evictions of people who recently went through foreclosure and are now having evictions hanging over their heads? Please have this question shared and addressed during the upcoming meeting. Thank you for your time and effort. This one is from Charlene Ashendorf. Dear Mayor Foley and City Council members, thank you for your service and work above and beyond the call of duty. Over the last week, you have proven once again that we are a city of service and excellence. Your vision, your ideas, your partnerships, and a singular effort to keep this community safe are to be commended. To our city staff committed to deliver service and get the jobs done, whatever they may be, give us great pride. In the midst of crisis, Costa Mesa re remains strong. Um, my name is Martina Go, and I'm a Costa Mesa resident and have been for the past 15 years with my parents. I am writing to ask for demand on freezing rent for businesses and individuals in Costa Mesa during this COVID-19 outbreak. We need your full protection and support during these tough times. Please, please think this over thoroughly. Having thoughts of those who are not going through hardships, who are now going through hardships during this time in our city financially. Thank you. Um, this is from Natalia Eshiviria. In lieu of the COVID-19 crisis, many people are experiencing employment issues and housing concerns. What is the current plan to protect citizens in Costa Mesa? Will rent and utility freezes be considered for both individual households and businesses? The city of Philadelphia has already mandata mandated that utilities be frozen during this time as many citizens are now being ordered to work from home while others are not working or making income. This is in the best interest for citizens and businesses so that service workers are able to main jobs once crisis has passed. Will evictions be banned during this time? The city of New York has moved to ban evictions during this time. Is there something that could happen here to prevent a crisis? I hope to tune in during the city council meeting. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, this is from Jessica Wells. I'm writing on behalf 
of my own restaurant and fellow restaurant owners in my plaza in Costa Mesa. We are owners in the Marquis Plaza in Costa Mesa off 1500 Adams Avenue. As we're being told to close down our dine-in, we are considering closing altogether as business is hard with everybody scrambling to quarantine. I wanted to know if we can get an official letter from the OC Real Estate Authority mandating that our landlord release us from paying monthly rent while we close our businesses temporarily. Can you please help? Thank you very much. I, uh, this one's anonymous. I'm from, I am a concerned employee for IKEA Costa Mesa in regards to non-essential businesses not having a mandated closure at this time. And this concern is shared amongst all my colleagues. It is actually heightened with recent news of our neighbors at South Coast Plaza shutting down due to the confirmed case of one of its employees. Many customers through the store are causing the crowds to be more than what is currently recommended by the CDC, and the majority of them do not seem to be going to the store to fulfill an urgent need. On the contrary, they seem to just meandering around the store, coming into contact with the displays that are touched and tested by hundreds of other customers. Our call-out list is extensive because people simply do not feel comfortable working, and it was made clear to us that without a mandated closure, there is no intention to cease operations, with the exception of a confirmed case occurring. The CDC is encouraging prevention, sitting around and waiting for a case to occur and put hundreds of people at risk, as well their families does not seem like a smart way to prevent the virus from spreading. We're told Costa Mesa is not a hot red zone and closure may not be necessary, but not taking those preventative measures will only ensure that becoming a hot red zone will be a matter of not if, but when. Thank you. A concerned IKEA employee. And this one is from Joanne Perler. This is the last one. I'm a resident of Costa Mesa and will be celebrating my 70th birthday in August. By law, California residents aged 70 or older must renew their license in person at a DMV office. I am concerned that going to the crowded DMV office will unnecessarily expose me and other elderly citizens to the coronavirus. Public health officials within the state and federal government have identified Persons over 60 is the highest risk group for complications from the coronavirus. The governor's office recommends senior citizens over 65 remain at home and avoid all crowded situations. The federal government recommends senior citizens avoid gatherings with over 10 people. Over 20 people in Orange County have already tested positive for the coronavirus and California infectious disease specialists as well as the CDC project that it will continue to spread exponentially throughout local communities within the state as it can no longer be contained. I contacted the DMV and was advised that there were no plans to accommodate senior citizens over to 70 years old and directed me to make an appointment with my local DMV. This is unacceptable. Action must be taken immediately to change this policy. The easiest course would be to me immediately suspend the requirement until the coronavirus is no longer a threat. This would allow the DMV time to identify interim arrangements for this age group. I personally appreciate the reason for this requirement for California's over 70 drivers has come about, and it does make sense for the DMV to satisfy the spirit of the law while protecting the at-risk population. There are, in fact, several measures that can be adopted immediately and over time to assure that people over 70 are qualified. One, online tests or interactive DMV courses patterned after online traffic school programs can be administered. DMV customers can submit certification of adequate vision from their eye doctors. Safe spaces can be created near DMV facilities for risk customers to take the driver's test and eye exam. Thumbprints are already in fire for over 70 drivers for over 70 drivers renewing their license, negating the requirement for new thumb thumbprints. I respectfully request that the city council become involved with this key issue by demanding immediate action from the government, governor and our state legislators, reaching out to the county board of supervisors to also address this issue with the governor and their respective state legislators, reaching out and coordinating with other city councils to put optimum pressure on the governor and other state legislators to solve this problem immediately. It is unfair to force at-risk citizens to choose between exposure to a potentially fatal disease or relinquish their ability to drive and then they provided some links and thank you very much thank you very much okay um, I'll bring that item up I think that's a reasonable request on the DMV issue there is an inherent conflict there so I'll bring that up with our assemblywoman so she can raise that 
So they have ongoing discussions at the Capitol these days. Um, okay, uh, Ms. Farrell Harrison, you gave your report. Does anyone on the phone have any questions or does any council member, and at this time we're going to just use the voice request for the floor? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens, did you have a question? Or no, comment? It's just I thought, I thought that the gentleman who talked about the um, ability to use the showers and bathrooms at the 24 hour fitness made a reasonable point. And I think uh, staff should kind of think about that. So, so what we're asking for right now, I think, is a motion. Do you have a motion also? Or? Well, I, don't have, I thought it was questions. I have no motion. Okay. I'm just saying. It, I, I'm just saying that that was something that I hadn't thought about before. So it'd be good if staff looked into that. If there's a way to carve that out, so that the folks who uh, are members of 24 Hour Fitness, just for the purpose of obtaining shower and uh, hygiene facilities, could still use it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, um, Councilman Reynolds, just one moment. I want to get some clarity from Ms. Barlow. Do you need a motion on this item? Because right now we're in the special meeting and all we're doing is taking action on the waiver of the citations. Do we need to have a motion or we don't? We would appreciate a motion on that one item. It's a recommendation. Um, it has not been made in order, so we are asking you to uh, authorize staff to do that. Okay, so my apologies, Council. I kind of got us off the wrong track because I wasn't sure what we were doing. So if if we could just get a motion to start. Manuel. And, um, Councilman Reynolds, did you want to make a motion or you want to wait? Um, well, tell me if this needs a motion. I was just going to ask that um, if we could at the very least to get um, some information up at those facilities, like on the door of the fitness centers, on the doors of the libraries that help connect people with the existing services we have. Okay. So, uh, uh, Council Member Chavez, did you have a motion? Yes, I move forth the item as presented by, by staff. Okay. Is there a second? Mar second. Councilmember Marr seconded. Okay, now we'll open it up to discussion as to those items, and that would be waiver of citations for residential parking permits and or street sweeping and then not enforcing the, uh, the street uh, residential parking program. Is that your motion, Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Okay, Councilmember Marr, do you concur? Yes. Okay, and so if anyone re wishes to speak to the motion, can you please ask for the floor verbally? Okay, Councilmember Guinness. We're not using the, we're not using the, oh, okay, yeah, sorry. I know, go ahead and put, go ahead and request it. I'll do it again, yeah. It's different because you're up here. Okay. Okay. Um, I will not be supporting the motion. I believe I see a rationale for not enforcing the street sweeping um, citations because there are people who will be home during the day who will not have a place to put their car because this, when the street sweeper goes by. However, the residential parking program was developed at the request each neighborhood, we probably had dozens and dozens of residents. They got petitions in their neighborhoods they um, came down usually numerous, numerous times. We now have a study going on. And I am really concerned that we're suddenly just jumping into this. And pretty much, I don't see a connection to an emergency whatsoever. In fact, I could see more problems for people being exposed to things, because people who could no longer park in front of their own home will have a variety of people coming and going, and they will have to park further away and be encountering more people. So if you're asking people to shelter in place, you're making it more difficult for the resident who now has a place to park right by their house to shelter in place. Um, so I'm going to offer a substitute motion 
that we waive the, the citations and the fees for parking violation during street sweeping days. Let's see if I get a second. second. Okay. Council Member Mansour seconded. Uh, Council Member Mansour, did you want to speak to the motion? Yep. Thank you very briefly. I, I agree with what Council Member Guinness said. Um, I, I'm fine for waiving a citation if someone got it for street sweeping, something like that. But I see no reason to undo the complete uh, residential permit parking uh, that we've worked so hard to get so many residents, um, especially on such short notice like that. Nobody is here uh, to comment on it because nobody knew about it. I, I don't see the urgency in this. I, we, well, you could argue there might be some urgency on some of the street sweeping. I'd be fine with that. But if we're going to really dismantle the residential permit parking, that should be noticed and people should have an opportunity to come speak uh, for or against that. Thank you. Okay. Um I will not be supporting the substitute motion because I do think that there's a sense of urgency. Would the maker of the underlying motion agree to a limited period of time of March 16th through March 31st? Uh, that is fine, Madam Mayor. Okay, does the second concur? Would you consider moving that out to 30 days? to 30 days, March 16th through April 16th? Correct. Okay, does the, does the maker of the motion agree? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so I won't be supporting the motion. I do think that under these circumstances, uh, we don't have the capacity to do enforcement of our parking permit program right now because we don't have any staff members who we can send out to do that because we are in emergency response mode and all of our city workers have been designated as disaster service workers and so we are not going to be able to be enforcing it anyway and um, I wouldn't want to have expectation from our residents who live in the permit parking zones that somehow if they call somebody's going to come out because we we just don't have capacity so i think that's one reason secondly if we are requiring everyone to stay at home we're going to see you know more cars and we're just going to have to be flexible in our communities for a brief period of time to accommodate people parking in their uh you know, in their neighborhoods. So uh, certainly I, I don't support us issuing citations right now when many of our residents are being laid off from work. They're, they're not because they did anything wrong, but because businesses are literally being forced to close unexpectedly. So we need to do as government everything that we can to relieve the pressure on them. So um, for those reasons, I don't support the motion. Call for the question on the substitute motion. No, we're going to have to do it by a voice call. Okay, so. Um, this is on the substitute motion? On the substitute motion. Council Member Chavez. No. Council Member Guinness. Council Member Mansour. Yes. Council Member Marr. No. Council Member Reynolds. No. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. <clears throat> no. Mayor Foley. No. So the motion fails five two or two five with um, council council members Chavez, Marr, Reynolds, Stevens, Foley voting no. Okay, call for the question on the original motion with the amendment. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Gannis? No. Council Member Mansour? No. Council Member Marr? Yes. Council Member Reynolds? Yes. Can Mayor Pro Tem Stevens? Yes. Mayor Foley? Yes. Motion passes 5 2 with Council Members Gannis and Mansour voting no. Okay, um, at this time we will adjourn the special meeting and then we will move to our regular meeting of the City Council and Successor Agency to the development, Redevelopment Agency for Tuesday, March 6, 17th, 2020. And at this time, will everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance 
There is no one to give the moment of solemn expression tonight, and so I will just say a few words, and here we go. Please say with me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, America, States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, which stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Um, just take a moment of silence for our country and to um, think about all of our first responders, our healthcare workers, our city employees, our county employees, our state employees, our teachers and our counselors, everyone who is called to be at this moment a disaster service worker. Um, and what we're going through is pretty unprecedented. So just take a moment of silence to think about and be grateful that we have so many good people helping us. Okay, Ms. Green, can you please call the roll for the regular meeting? Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Chavez. Here. Councilmember Gannis. Here. Councilmember Mansour. Here. Councilmember Marr. Here. Councilmember Reynolds. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Here. Mayor Foley. Present. Thank you. Okay, uh, City Attorney, do we have a closed session report? Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, we do have um, a reportable action on one item, and that is on, oh, wrong agenda, of course. Um, a closed session item number eight, I believe, which was a potential initiation of litigation, um, and uh, uh, that, uh, there was a motion on that item, um, moved by Mayor Foley, seconded by Councilmember Guinness, and approved on a vote of seven to zero, uh, authorizing the city attorney's office to pursue litigation. Uh, we aren't disclosing the facts and circumstances uh, so as not to prejudice the city's position. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, um, we had a couple of presentations planned for tonight, but obviously under the circumstances, those will be continued and rescheduled hopefully to a time when we're back to normal, which no one knows when that may be at this point. So we will not be hearing from the Human Relations Commission uh, presentation for tonight. Um, we had a Women's History Month proclamation, which we don't have, and so we will just proclaim that it's Women's History Month. Um, hopefully you all have recognized and looked at women in history doing a lot of work to get us here. There's no Costa Mesa Minute tonight, and next up is, um, I don't know if you had a, a presentation on the homeless shelter, no. Do you wanna do it or no? I mean, oh, Susan, okay. So, is she here? She's on the phone? Ms. Yes, I'm here. Okay, Ms. Price, maybe you can give a brief presentation and then maybe you can also address what we're doing uh, to respond to some of the concerns that were raised by the speakers at the podiums, as well as, you know, what are we doing to help people who are on our streets right now under the circumstances of COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor and City Council, I uh, just want to start off by thanking the people that came for public comment or um, spoke today because definitely their feedback has been important as we make our response to address homelessness in Costa Mesa. I just have a couple of updates that are critical. Um, the first one is that we were going to schedule some community meetings um, around the church because we are um, working on the construction plan for the more permanent site and we'll be reaching out to the community that lives within a half a mile of the Lighthouse Church um, to talk about a negotiated lease extension through the end of the year. And we're asking for the community's feedback regarding that um, as we move forward on the transition, um, which is a critical step in our efforts to address homelessness. So um, that notification will go out in the mail uh, to people that live within a half a mile of the um, Lighthouse um, Shelter Program. So um, with that, we're not going to do an open community meeting, but we're asking people to provide their feedback via email or phone. 
Um, with regards to the currently operating shelter, we have a census of um, 45 people there right now, and we are working to respond to the, the governor's initiatives around um, social distancing of six feet, as well as looking at um, our most vulnerable population within the homeless population of people 65 and over, and those with chronic health conditions um, to self-isolate. Did some? Did we lose someone? No, I think I think it's okay. Okay. Um, and so, with that, we are um, working with our fire department and with our community providers um, to evaluate some of the more critical needs of our vulnerable homeless population with regards to um, meals and those that are in the shelter, as well as those that are uh, not in the shelter that are being reached out to via street outreach with hand sanitizer and other things for their um, hygiene needs. We're also working with the county on um, kind of the um, other opportunities with the armories to, you know, expand sheltering of people that are currently um, outside. And we have done outreach to people that um, are living in cars within our city. And I know one of our uh, public commenters was talking about that. Um, we're doing our best to reach out to that population. Um, and with the feedback that we got tonight, I'll be looking um, for an expansion of a shelter, I mean, a, a showering program, either at our site or somewhere nearby and working with the county to get that supported. Um, in addition, should we come um, close in, in dealing with exposure to the COVID-19, um, we may need to go into a, a shelter-in-place model, potentially using motel vouchers or other sites that the county has identified um, or will soon identify, hopefully, related to armories um, in the county. So a lot of work going on there and more to come on a weekly basis uh, with updates. And just another note on a happy note, uh, we've housed our 50th person as of yesterday. And so I just want to thank the team and the amazing partnership with our community providers that are working with us to meet all of the gaps um, in the vulnerable population that we're serving in our communities during this most difficult time with COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, at this time we will have public comments. Any items that are not on the agenda. If you'd like to speak to us, please come to the podium. And just a reminder, just because it's a habit, don't touch the, don't touch anything. <laughs> I'm not going to touch anything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm commenting regarding the Planning Commission uh, next March 23rd. And um, I spoke earlier regarding the um, COVID-19 problem with the people up applying and being able to make comments. But this uh, project as we fought in 2010 was one sign. This is three signs at a total square footage of 2,680 feet. One sign, they're at all three signs of uh, Triangle Square, 19th and Harbor, Harbor and Newport Boulevard, Newport Boulevard and 19th. And these signs will be 800, 1200 and 680 individually. And these signs are going to be flashing, blinking, moving, changing dialogue, colors in a heavily traveled area. Um, the community didn't want it in 2010. Uh, we certainly don't want it now. And it does seem a little coincidental that um, not only was this put in at a time um, that was, you know, somewhat politically motivated, but that uh, Justin Martin and his wife donated $9,700 to, um, to the mayor's Senate committee uh, run. So, I would very much like for this to be postponed. I would like for some more input in the community. The community does not know anything about this. And at least give us time so that we can um, see if we can get comments from the community. This is gonna have light spillover on Broadway in some of the residential areas. So this process is just really outrageous. We don't wanna be the Las Vegas of Orange County. Thank you. Okay, anyone else wish to speak to this item, or to 
not to this item, to public comment. I'm not touching anything. I'm just <laughs> putting it on here, and I have a sanitizing wipe to wipe after. Okay. I know it's it's terrible time. Sorry. Um, first, I would just. I understand that a lot is going on, but I think starting on time or close to on time is essential because I'm not sure what was going on with the people who are watching from home, but um, I probably wouldn't wait for, you know, an hour and 15 minutes for a meeting to start. Um, also, I just would like a clarification with what's essential and uh, versus non-essential. I don't even consider this meeting particularly essential. Uh, people can't participate, and I just see problems with putting things on the agenda where people really can't come and meaningfully participate. I feel like fire is essential, police is essential, but this probably isn't. Um, and uh, so I want to say that. Then regarding the homeless shelter, I would like to know the cost overruns. Um, it is my understanding they're between uh, 1.5 million and 2.5 million. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm correct or not, but not only is it nine months late, it, there's all, also large cost overruns. Um, I was a critic of purchasing the property because I felt that was a quick decision. There was a court order to provide those beds, but we could have rented and, and moved more slowly and more fiscally, um, in a more fiscally responsible way. Um, I also want to comment about the signs. I, I do think that that should not be on the uh, Planning Commission's agenda, even if it does go on, because it will not allow the community to participate in a meaningful way. And just because we have an emergency situation and certain rights are suspended doesn't mean the democracy is suspended. and it would not really be in the interest of democracy to ram this through. Um, and uh, I hope that things will be dealt in, in you know, a fair and, and correct way to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other speakers, we will close the public comment. And at this time, we will move to, oh, I'm sorry, I have to ask, did the, do we have any um, public comments from the community that were emailed? Um, Mayor, no, we do not. Okay, thank you. Okay, council member committee reports, comments, and suggestions. We'll start with council member Mansour. Council member Guinness. Sorry. There you go. Okay, there we go. I think I get four, but because um, it says three minutes. But anyway. I wasn't um, even going to put it on. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> number one, I'd like to thank staff for all their work in, in this really trying time. There's been an awful lot of extra going back and forth, and, and I know it's a difficult time. And so I'd like to thank our staff. And I'd also like to thank the grocery store workers because they've been putting up with people who are cranky, people with, who are pulling everything off the shelves, um, having to restock the shelves constantly. So when you go to the grocery store, thank your grocery store workers. And if while you were at the store, you kind of got carried away in the whole hysteria and you bought too much, consider donating to a food pantry. They all could use extra help right now or sharing with a neighbor who maybe couldn't get out. And if you have a lot of extra food, please store it safely. If you just put bunches of bags of rice and, and flour and whatnot in your garage, you're going to be drawing ro roaches and rats. And Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control is going to be working on some materials on um, storing your extra food safely so we don't end up with a vector problem down the road. And then finally, when this whole COVID-19 thing started, I had some concerns, not so much at the local level, but it seems like every time something bad happens, we lose some of our civil liberties or people use it as an excuse to pass a regulation that they've been wanting to pass all the time anyway, and this is the time to jump on. And as um, was said, by Rahm Emanuel, I think, never waste a good crisis. And I think that's what happened here tonight. Um, 
I see the thing on, on parking restrictions on street sweeping days. It does kind of make a certain amount of sense when people are not at their jobs. But when we take a program that's been worked out over a long period of time involving hundreds of residents and just say, oh, never mind, when it really relates very, very tangentially to the crisis at hand, that's really disappointing. I, I actually, to be honest, expected infringements on our civil rights at the federal level or infringements on the democratic process at other levels, and I'm kind of disappointed to see that happening here. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, it's going to be tough, and we can just remember to take precautions. I'm not going to tell you to wash your hands again because everybody's told you that. Um, but just try to keep calm and don't let your stress spill over onto other people because I think a lot of us have been doing that lately. I confess. Um, anyway, my motto for right now is keep calm and carry on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reynolds, you're up. Yeah, I just want to say a quick thank you to the team at City Hall. Um, I think while many of us uh, have the luxury of staying home, uh, we have our, our whole team at City Hall, all of our staff being called uh, to do extra work to prepare us um, with both the immediate needs and then prepare us for potential worst-case scenarios. Um, I'm extremely proud of the hires that we've made. Um, this year and the leadership team that we have, um, they're doing an amazing job and, and we just can't thank them enough. Um, to the public who are listening, please do keep them in your prayers and, and wish them well. Um, thank you to everyone in the community for um, taking this situation seriously. The rules are changing every day to mitigate impacts. Um, I'm staying home. I've stolen my parents' keys, so they have to stay home. Um, it's really, really important that we follow the rules that are being set by our, our health officials. Um, please do communicate with us the needs that you have um, and, and be patient with us while we work through um, best ways to address those needs. We're certainly listening and we have a long list of, of things we're trying to work through to make this crisis as, as least stressful and as least costly as possible for all of us. Um, I feel strongly that, that um, as a city, we have in our priorities um, the desire to keep people housed, the desire to keep people fed. Uh, we want to minimize costs and unnecessary stress across the community um, and very concerned about our local businesses and keeping um, our local businesses intact through this crisis. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please stay tuned to all of the communications that we're sending um, this is a time for Costa Mesa to come together, and we're, we're working really hard for you. Thank you. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and, and thank you, Councilmember Reynolds, for those um, eloquent comments. I, I think what we can take out of all of this is um, we're very blessed to have such an amazing staff in Costa Mesa, um, and I really want to just take a quick time to commend everyone who is actually home today um, and doing the best practices for, for this COVID-19 crisis. You know, it's times like these where we have to come together and work as a team. You know, we're all one team here in Costa Mesa. So we're all one family. We're all in this together. Um, and it's important for us to do our part. Um, I particularly want to reach out to people who are my age, who are younger. Um, it falls on us a bit more than others because we do have a grasp of the Internet a bit better, a bit more. And we also have the ones who are least likely to show any signs of symptoms to be contract COVID-19. You know, I think one piece of advice I, I heard that was really helpful for me was, let's assume we all have it and act accordingly in that manner. So for those that have um, family members who are older and were risk um, appropriate age, act in that manner, keep them safe, because really we're all a family and teaming this together. Um, furthermore, as, as mentioned by Kevin Reynolds, Please follow us on our websites. Um, you know, we have updates every day on what's going on in the county and in Costa Mesa. Um, and also, please reach out to us. You know, this is a time where if you have concerns, you have questions, we're the, we the point person for all this mayhem. And 
feel free to use us to get clarity on what's going on. Um, I feel very competent in our staff. I feel very confident in our city. And I feel very confident in our residents that we're going to pull through, guys. So thank you for all of listening in today. And we'll be all on this together. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Council Member Mark. Um, I don't have any additional comments. I think that was very well said by the last two council members. Um, thank you for everyone who has reached out and is staying home and is doing the right thing. If you need anything, if you've got neighbors who need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim Stevens. All right. Well, so we got some bright news uh, earlier when uh, Susan Price said that the 50th person out of our shelter was how uh, housed and found permanent uh, housing. So it's good in this in this day and age of the coronavirus to get some happy news. And that occurred within one year of the time of opening our shelter in uh, in April. So that's gr great news. As for the issues with the coronavirus, yes, um, uh, Council Member Reynolds and Council Member Chavez spoke very well about that, and I I agree. Our staff could not be stronger on this. I'm very proud of our staff. I'm also proud of the way that our business community has come up and complied and, you know, to their own personal sacrifice. And then all of the employees and the people that uh, work for a living in our community are trying to keep our community safe. And it's a very unusual time. I've got a 95-year-old mother who um, is uh, obviously, uh, you know, required to be by herself and uh she has said to me she's never seen anything like this in her lifetime this is a once in a lifetime thing and we're going to get through it together and thank you for everybody who's uh making sacrifices and working together to get through it all right thank you uh i couldn't agree more with what everyone has said it is a unique time for sure and we have the right team at the right time. We have a city manager who has emergency response experience and emergency management. We have a, a new emergency services manager who has emergency response and emergency management uh, capabilities. We have the fire chief who is the chair of the all the fire chiefs. Um, and so he has a lot of experience. We have a new police chief who has institutional knowledge and is commanding his team very well. And then we have, of course, uh, Susan Price, who's now with us, our assistant city manager, who has experience working at the county. So we've got some continuum of um, resources and access there. So everybody has been working really hard. Of course, Kim Barlow, our city attorney, has multiple agencies that she's serving. And so we're getting the benefit of all of us sharing information and um, and of course, much like some of us here, she's also a workaholic like the rest of you all out there. <laughs> um, so, and so our city team is doing an, an incredible job. We've, uh, our communications team is working around the clock to try to be responsive to the community and get information out because we know that everyone is just so, everything has to be so instantaneous and people wanna know and they want answers yesterday. So thank you to Roxy and Tony and uh, Connor and uh, Nassetti, right? Is that, do I got them all? Um, to our, our communications team and they have been working really hard and thank you to Connor and his team, Constituent Services, to responding to everyone. And thank you to Ms. Green for your team, getting all these last minute meetings all put together and making sure that we're all compliant. <laughs> um, so we can't thank everyone enough. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is, a, it's just everyone all hands on deck and we're gonna do our best to get us through this. I think that we as a council uh, made a very good decision early on in this whole process in January uh, to kind of push back and to demand information and protocols and procedures and that protected I th our community from having a, a 
quicker spread. I, I feel very strongly about that. Um, so the litigation was critical for us. Um, and then now we're just trying to manage it. But it is, it's, it's here, OK? Everyone needs to understand that. We must stay home. I say that while we're sitting here. Unfortunately, some of us have actual, we have requirements of law that we have to comply with. But we must encourage you strongly, especially if you are over 60, please stay home. Do not get out. Do not go to the grocery store. Try to get a neighbor maybe to shop for you. Try not to get out into public because it's such a highly contagious uh, virus. And um, we just want everyone to stay safe. Uh, our, our young people, thank you, Councilmember Chavez, for mentioning that. Uh, our young people, it's very important. You can't just hang out with your friends. You know, I've got two tweens at home. We've had this conversation multiple times. Um, they are carriers. And not to mention what no one really talks about, but possibly you have some undiagnosed condition that this COVID-19 virus could cause to be exacerbated or accelerate that condition and you could be harmed for the rest of your life. So it's not just about you're young and strong and healthy. Um, it's not gonna affect you. It may affect you too. So please, please, please listen to the um, advice of medical experts and everybody just stay home. Take advantage of it. You know, read a book. No one ever gets to read books anymore. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. City manager report. Ms. Farrell Harrison, do you have any report? Or <laughs> Whatever you want to give. Yeah. We have a lot to report. That's why I asked. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to give uh, some highlights on what we're doing in terms of uh, just the activities that we're taking as a city to protect the community as much as possible and to put in as many proactive measures as possible to reduce the risk of the spread of COVID-19. Again, social distancing is key. Home isolation to the extent that you can is also key. Um, to that end, this morning, we call for the closure of movie theaters, fitness clubs, and limiting restaurants to takeout and delivery services only, effective tonight at 11.59 p.m. Uh, today, um, this is in concert with the most conservative guidance, which is in direct alignment with many actions that are being taken by other levels of government. The city is carefully considering every decision and is working around the clock to prevent the risk of further transmission of COVID-19. And as such, these closures are crucial and in the best interest of our community. We ask in advance uh, for your patience as a community. We may be uh, making decisions very quickly uh, with what may appear to be insufficient notice to you. We're doing that out of an abundance of caution to protect you, to protect the community, and to make sure that we're following the best CDC scientific guidance um, as we receive it. And so again, please check our website. We have uh, different social media tools that we're using to communicate to you uh, as we get information and an abundance of caution through the end of April, um, most city facilities, including city hall and community centers will be closed to the public. The exception currently is the front counter of the police department that's open for limited service. For continuing service from our public counters in development services, in finance, and also in public services, please see our website for additional information about how we will be providing uh, service to you elect electronically or online. Please check our website, of course, at www.costamesaca.gov. And we just wanted to note that open space venues still remain open to the public, including our parks and golf courses. However, we do strongly encourage home isolation and also um, social distancing in any public venue at all whatsoever. And I think that's our, our report for uh, this evening. Please continue to, um, again, check our website for information. And uh, we're here for you. And, and please uh, practice as much social distancing as you possibly can. Thank you. One other item related to that, while our public parks are open, we are not allowing people of 
10 or more to gather in the park. So this came up today as it relates to the skate park because we had to close the park because there were more than 10 people there. So keep that in mind, the 10 or more rule will be enforced. Okay, Ms. Barlow, any further city attorney report? Uh, I No, we, I just, just keep in mind that things are changing on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> we are um, trying to make sure that we're staying as transparent and open to the public as possible. Um, but we face really, really enormous restrictions in terms of our, uh, the time of our personnel uh, and the, you know, the compliance with all of the different orders that are coming down. So uh, we ask the, the public to be patient with us, uh, especially in terms of things like Public Records Act requests and so on. We're just not going to be able to get to them in the same uh, time period as normal. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be acted upon in one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the city council staff or the public request specific items to be discussed and removed from the consent calendar for discussion. Madam Clerk, does the council or public request any items be pulled? Yes, item number five has been pulled by a uh, member of the public, Ralph Taboda, and also by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Okay, um, and no other items have been requested. So if we could have a motion as it relates to the consent calendar, and then I will be recusing myself from item number five, as I have a conflict related to uh, a donation from way back that is not quite a year, but almost. <laughs> um, well, before we were talking about this, um, and uh, so I won't be able to vote on this item. So can I have a motion by voice call? Okay, is there a second? Motion by Guinness, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, second by Mar. Call for the question. Okay, and I will be doing this by voice vote. Um, no, it's voice. This is related to the rest of the consent calendar. All right, uh, Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Gannis? Yes. Council Member Mansour? Yes. Council Member Marr? Yes. Council Member Reynolds? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens? Yes. Mayor Foley? Yes. Okay. okay. So uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens will be taking over for item number five. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you very much, Mayor Foley. Will um, the clerk please read the item, the title? Item number five is adoption of an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the city council of the city of Costa Mesa, California, providing for a reduction of the business tax set forth in article five, administration, application and procedures of chapter one business tax as authorized by measure X, the Costa Mesa medical marijuana measure as amended, that is levied upon the lawful distri distribution, manufacturing, testing, and or research and development of marijuana. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So um, I'm not sure we need a presentation. Is anybody there uh, who is going to make a presentation? If not, I think um, maybe I could just explain why I pulled it and uh, we, can we can open it up to the public comment. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, um, there will be no staff presentation. All right. The only reason I pulled it was the issue of the permanency of um, the 1% reduction. And I think, obviously, we've had a lot of issues that have occurred in the last two weeks. And uh, we voted on March 3rd in a very different environment to make the reduction in the cannabis uh, tax permanent, which would mean that it could only be increased um, with a vote of the people. Uh, that change was uh, different than what we had modeled, which was the Long Beach uh, uh, statute, which allows the city council to increase it, reserve that right. And so in light of the um, fiscal issues that we're likely to face, I thought um, uh, at a minimum, we should either consider tonight um, reserving the right to increase the tax or 
at a minimum, continuing it to another period of time where um, we let the, um, you know, the community that came out at the last meeting know that we were reconsidering that issue. So that's the reason I pulled it. I don't want to change any of the rates. I just think uh, when we're talking about something relating to revenue, uh, we shouldn't uh, make something permanent under the circumstances that we now face. So that's the reason I pulled it. Now we can open it up, I think, to public comment. Unless I don't think we need questions. Does anybody have questions? Any council member? I'm not hearing yes. any questions. Yes. I, who's right, got a, I did. Who's got a, council member Mark. Uh, uh, council member Mark's got a question. Go ahead. Um, so I thought we we did talk about this, about the notion of whether or not we were able to add language to that effect to say the city council reserves the right to raise this. And city attorney Barlow had a very specific answer for that. So could, could we hear that again? Yeah, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. Um, yes, my recommendation was that we specifically... Um, indicate that the reduction is uh, temporary. Uh, you can either make it uh, temporary until, in other words, you could have it be effective until it is repealed or modified, um, or uh, so long as you are clearly making, including language, that the top rate of the 6% as it's currently worded uh, would remain available to you in the future. Thank you. Uh, who, does anybody else have questions? Or are you, is that your only question, uh, Council Member Marr? Yes. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Um, Mayor Patel, this is Council Member Chavez. Um, so, Ms. Ms. Barlow, if you can kind of elaborate a bit more, just to kind of like break it down for the audience, is what you're saying that unless we add that language, we can't? Back to six percent. That is correct. Without uh, without language reserving, you know, maintain. Let me try and clarify. If if the language of the code specifically says the top rate is six percent, and we the council are setting it at the rate of X percent for either temporary basis with some specified time parameters, or until we change our minds by you know, subsequent ordinance, uh, repeal, or uh, modification. Uh, without that language, uh, a reduction of the tax uh, to a to zero uh, or 1% uh, in, in either case will um, prevent you from uh, raising it simply by council action. It would have to go to a vote of the people. That is uh, accordan uh, in accordance with Proposition 218. Thank you. And it, just real quick, uh, uh, this is Mayor Pro Tem Stevens, just to add, and and we made it crystal quick, clear with our vote on March 3rd, it was permanent. And of course, circumstances have changed, which would require it to be go to a vote of the people. Anyway, any other questions? Okay, let's hear from the public. Um, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Oh, yes, we do have a member of the public here. Hello, Council Members. It's Steve Hellings from SW Ventures. So um, the only comment I would have on this is I think changing it without a majority of the people here, um, I, I think would be a mistake. Um, if you, you know, when we came left here, it was, it was the understanding that the vote was for permanence. Um, and I think we're, everybody's making business plans. And the reality is in terms of emergency, we're shut down till March 31st period. So, um, the reality is we're relying on that more than ever. So I would highly, um, recommend that if we're going to do something that's going to change something so drastically that that would need to be done where people are allowed to attend um, in a more thorough way. Otherwise, it may be perceived that it was done, you know, when no one was paying attention. Thank you. 
Thank you. you could just Who's next? Continue it. All right. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, we do not have any other people here, but I do have the letter from um, Ralph Taboda that I would like to read at this time. Um, I urge council to reconsider the cannabis gross receipts tax issue. My specific concern is making this a permanent change in the tax rate. The legal cannabis industry is a young industry and thus new to Costa Mesa. There are more unknowns than knowns. Excerpts from the March 3rd staff report first reviewed by council support this point. There is limited data to support ACRA revenue projections. The long-term impact of a reduction of the marijuana business tax is less clear. Staff is unable to provide the long-term fiscal impact of the proposed tax reduction and is thereby only recommending a temporary reduction. You can't have a reliable financial projection based only on one year. The way I look at it, whether in our personal or business lives, we want to be flexible. We want to give ourselves options. And the more options we have, the better we can deal with issues and the more chance of success we have. The same applies to Costa Mesa. The city wants to be flexible when dealing with issues. It wants and needs options on how it deals with issues. I'm sure when dealing with the COVID-19 virus, the more options Costa Mesa has, the better. So where am I going with this? If you make this tax reduction permanent, you are taking away flexibility the city could and should have. Permanency denies the city the option to reevaluate the cannabis business environment in the future. It paints the city in a box. Nobody knows what the legal cannabis market will look like two to four years from now. Nobody knows the price sensitivity of this product. If the feds and state get a handle on the legal market, the business environment for the legal market, including Costa Mesa businesses, will look a lot different. The initial proposal was for a two-year time period to reevaluate the tax rate. Local businesses objected, thinking it still posed too much risk for them. Council can lengthen the reevaluation period. The important thing is for Costa Mesa to retain options to remain flexible, to allow itself to be able to respond when the business environment changes and it will change. I urge council to make to not make this a permanent tax change. Thank you. And that conclude, concludes all the public comments. Um, I believe that the council members here, council member Mansour wants to speak. Um, just give me one second and I'll activate his mic. Uh Council Member Mansour, you had a, a question. There's no motion. Did you want to make a motion? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get the Or do you want to make a question? Okay. Council Member Mansour. Can you hit your mic button? Do request to speak now? Why don't we do? Why don't we do this? If we could, uh, uh, Councilmember Monster, why don't you wait? I'll make a motion, and then if I get a second, then you could speak to the motion or ask whatever question. So, my motion is to um, go with the one percent that we agreed to, but include language in the ordinance that reserves the right for the city council on a majority vote to increase the tax up to six percent that's my motion oh, okay uh, uh mayor pro tem sorry we're having a uh, technical difficulty um so i don't want to interrupt you i'm ready to speak whenever you are you made a motion i think you're waiting for a second yeah. but yeah I, I, do i get a second I'll second for discussion, Reynolds. Reynolds second for discussion. Now you are you uh, restate your motion. Answer. Yeah, the motion is is we have the ordinance as it is, this is the one percent and zero percent on testing, but we reserve the right to uh, increase that up to the six percent with a majority vote of the council. Seconded for discussion, and now um, uh, Councilmember Mansour, you were first in the queue. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a substitute motion that we approve uh, the recommended action as listed in the staff report, which would be to give the second reading 
uh, and approve the ordinance as we voted. We, we had a robust discussion. Uh, everybody was here uh, now tonight. Uh, there was one person here to speak up, so this is the, the council chamber is, is virtually empty, and I think this is the wrong time that would just send the wrong message to anyone who voted, for, who, who had something before the council and it was just automatically undone without giving notice to them to show up and participate or participate by phone or email or, or some other way. Um, also, I, I think now more than ever is the time uh, to keep the tax low. We want these, we need these businesses here in Costa Mesa more than ever. Give them a time uh, to grow, uh, no pun intended, um, <laughs> but uh, give them a time to, to really develop and plant the roots. And uh, in the future, uh, you know, one or two years down the road, if, if need be, let's take it to the voters. We can vote on it as a council. We could take it to the voters if we need to raise the tax. But um, it now is the wrong time to, to change it. So I have a substitute motion. I don't know if there's a second. Second, Mar. All right. So, hey, I didn't get a chance to, I didn't give myself a chance to talk on the uh, original motion, so I'm going to do that. Um, I hear what you're saying, and if if it's an if it's an issue of of wanting to have people be here to comment on it, that that's one thing. But um, we live in a different environment than we did on March third, and we have and and we have to uh, at least have flexibility to increase our revenue sources. And and I'm not sure that the council appreciates it, but maybe they do. But at 1%, in order to get to our budgeted revenue for cannabis tax, our, our cannabis industry will have to generate $100 million in sales to get to the budgeted revenue of this year's budget. And that's a line item in the budget that I'd like to see increase maybe at some point in time. And that's a big ask under this environment. And we're going to be looking for ways to raise revenues to pay for things like um, firefighters and police officers and po fixing potholes and things of that nature, essential services. And to close ourselves off from that, I personally think is fiscally irresponsible. So, um, and I'm, of course, against that. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that I, I'd urge you to vote against the substitute motion. And for the um, for the uh, motion that I made, uh, we may never increase the tax, but I don't think we should foreclose ourselves from doing it under the circumstance and under the environment that we're in. Does anybody else have anything to say on your motion? Councilmember Reynolds, I'm going to withdraw my second. Um, I hear what you're saying, Mayor Pertem. I think one of the real, my understanding of your motion is that the council can change the tax at any time. Um, and my understanding was that that uncertainty in the business community makes it very difficult for our cannabis businesses that we want to thrive um, to secure the contracts that we need them to secure. Um, so I'm not comfortable with the the sort of at any time proposal. Councilmember Mar, um, yeah. So I seconded the substitute motion. Um, I stand by that for all the reasons that Councilmember Reynolds just said. Um, also, I mean, I I did the math the last time in terms of what this industry would have to make, and I don't think we're going to be able to make up our revenue shortfall. Um, on the back of a struggling industry. Um, and so while I agree that we need to raise revenue, I'd like to look at POT, I'd like to look at business license fees and other and other methods of raising revenue. I don't think this is the way in which we um, solve our problems. So um, I'll be supporting um, such uh, This is Councilmember Chavez. Um, I want to thank everyone for this, this, this discussion we're having. Um, I want to thank Mayor Pro Tem for, for pulling the item. I know this is something we, we took a lot of time over last council meeting, um, and I, I think I I want to commend where he's coming from in his approach. You know, Mayor Patel looking at this is very fiscally in terms of the city's financials. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier today how we are all going to come come together as a, as a city to 
you know, overcome this crisis. Um, I, I just think because industry, because industry is so new, because it is a growing market, we're trying to grow. I think it's best to give the investors, the stakeholders in the community, that that certainty that despite the turbulent times, that mind you, they were facing before this crisis kind of over blue. Let's give them that certainty that this business can grow in Costa Mesa. Um, I'm very confident of the fact that Long Beach, just 30 miles away, has a very similar tax rate to ours, and, and we need to compete against the mar- market share from that industry. Um, I, I do see your point, Mayor Potem. This is not, th- this is a, the time to look at everything and have options on the table. I just think this, this industry does not have the legs to do that yet with it. You know, and perhaps maybe down the line, if, if the council deems, deems fit at some later point in time, we can put in the ballot initiative to, to raise that tax. But for the time being, I think it's, we need to honor our commitment to the industry and help it grow, especially now. And to echo Councilman Amar, we should be looking at those creative ways to maybe fix TOT tax to perhaps find other revenue streams we can use to tap into. But I don't think we'll get much from this industry, seeing as up until recently they weren't giving as much to begin with. So I think let's give them a chance to grow. Uh, okay, does anybody, uh, any council member have any other comments? No, I made my comments. Okay, I don't hear any other council members, so I'll, I'll call for the question. Hey. So, um, this, this is the substitute motion that you will be voting on. Sandy and replaced the uh, second on the original motion, so yes, this would be the substitute motion. Yeah. All right, and then... Um, uh. Sorry, thank you. Council Member Chavez. Council Sorry, Member. Yes. Thank you. Council Member Guinness. No. Council Member Mansoor. Yes. Council Member Marr. Yes. Council Member Reynolds. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. I'm going to vote no only to the permanent part. You know what I mean. And then Mayor Foley is recused. So the motion carries 4-2 with Mayor Pro Tem Stevens and Council Member Guinness voting no. All right, thank you. Mayor Foley. Uh, one second, I'm going to do this. Um, okay, we have two public hearing items tonight. Madam Clerk, will you please read the title? Thank you. Just can you give me one second? Um, okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Public hearing item one is a resolution establishing a sidewalk vendor permit application fee. Okay. And um, who's giving the, re- we ha- do we have a report? There, there will be. Ms. Farrell Harrison, you want to give the report? <laughs> <laughs> so we were just trying to reduce as many staff yeah, as possible. Yeah, of course, understand. So I'm, you, you're stuck with me. Uh, resolution establishing a sidewalk vending permit is bef- application is before you this evening. Uh, we're proposing uh, the application fee. As you know, we did bring the sidewalk vending ordinance to you that has been adopted. And so as we start receiving applications, uh, we, did, we have to have a, an application fee. We did surveys of other cities. We also, as you know, have done a cost allocation report and a user fee study, and so we have a good amount of information in terms of how much it would cost to um, actually process the permit. We believe that this fee is uh, conservative and also in line with what's being adopted by other cities, and so we ask that you please adopt the fee this evening. Okay. We have no, oh, well, council, are there any questions regarding this item? If you have a question, please request the floor. Okay, hearing no one, um, is there anyone from the public who'd like to speak to this item? Seeing no one. Okay, 
There's a motion by Guinness, second by Mansoor. Madam Mayor, any, yes. could I ask the clerk to clarify whether we received any public comment on this item? Oh, thank you. Did we receive any public comment? No, we did not on okay. this item. Thank you. Thanks for the clarity. Uh, and are there any comments from council related to this item? Please request the floor. Hearing no one. Oh. Sorry. Reynolds, sorry, I didn't, was there, I heard you say motion, I didn't hear the motion. The motion is to approve the staff recommended action. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any any other comments, Councilman Reynolds? Um, I actually do have a question. So, um, given the current state of affairs, I'm assuming that we wouldn't, um, or maybe this is a question, would we plan to approve any sidewalk vending while we're in this? social distancing uh, situation? I think that's an excellent question. Madam Ms. Mayor. Ms. Barlow. Um, yes, we would expect given the fact that our uh, we are basically limited to essential services at this point, uh, processing new uh, business license applications under these circumstances normally would not be treated as an essential service unless it was an essential business, which this is not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, call for the question by voice vote. Thank you. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Gannis? Yes. Councilmember Mansour? Yes. Councilmember Marr? Yes. Councilmember Reynolds? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens? Yes. Mayor Foley? Yes. Okay. Do you want to report out? And the motion carries 7-0. Okay, uh, public hearing item number two, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Public hearing item two, public hearing for the vacation of excess right of way at 480 East 19th Street. Presentation by Ms. Rosales, uh, transportation manager. Ms. Rosales. You have to turn your mic on. There you go. Uh, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, uh, this public hearing is for the vacation of the excess right-of-way of 480 East 19th Street. At the request of the property owners, staff reviewed uh, this request to vacate the excess right-of-way and uh, looked at uh, the existing classification of East 19th, which is classified as a two-lane collector in the general plan. The proposed right-of-way, as shown on the map, is uh, 12 feet wide by 62 feet in length along the property. Um, if you look to the left um, side, the, le the map on the left side, you'll see that um, all the other properties along this frontage is already at the same right-of-way of the proposed vacation. So this would actually make uh, the property match all of the other uh, properties along East 19th. Uh, East 19th Street in this section is classified as a, um, as a class three bicycle boulevard. Um, and the cross section you can see there, what a class three bicycle boulevard is, it shares the road uh, with vehicles and bicyclists. Uh, with the vacation, we still have the full right of way section uh, for the street and the street is currently built to its um, current configuration as classified in the city's general plan. At the August uh, 2019 Bike Way and Walkability Committee, uh, the, the committee reviewed uh, this request and recommended to the City Council approval of the vacation of this right of way. Uh, this was presented to the Planning Commission in September, um, which the Planning Commission found the proposed vacation to be consistent with the general plan and adopted a resolution uh, noting that. Uh, the notice to notice of intent to vacate uh, the Excess right away was presented to the City Council on February 18th, 2020. So staff recommends adoption of the proposed resolution in the staff report, ordering the vacation of a portion of the right away of 480 East 19th Street and to authorize execution of the quick claim deed by the mayor and the city clerk. Okay, if there are any questions from the council, please ask for the floor. 
Councilmember Guinness, if you push your button and then I'll... Yeah. Oh, it worked. Thank you. Um, how does this affect the setback? Because I noticed the property line for the adjacent properties are already, the, the right of way has already been vacated, but the house seems to line up pretty well with all the other properties. So does this affect the required setback at all? I mean, would the house be able to be further forward or would it, would it still continue to line up with the other properties there? Um, the, the, uh, the house as it sits today meets the setback requirements. Um, in terms of if the house wanted to um, expand, um, I'm not sure about that, but um, the property owners didn't note that and, and are, are the ones making the request, and this would be beneficial to the city as, as it's currently city property. We have to maintain it, and, by, and it's excess to the city. It's not part of the right-of-way that we need for the street. Um, so that's one thing that I could find out and get back to you yeah, on. Well, yeah, so unfortunately, back. we don't have anybody in planning here. Um, but because um, I think that would have been a question, because I had a question, I had that question earlier. Um, but it does look like the other properties where it's already been vacated are lined up with this one. So it probably wouldn't open the door to a lot of problems. Okay, Good. any other council members with questions? Please request the floor by voice. See, hearing no one, I uh, will open this item up to public comment. Hearing from no one, close public comment. Council. Um, and Madam Mayor. Oh, sorry, and, yes. And we have received. I'll get used to this. <laughs> Ms. Green, any and We have received no, no comments from the public. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay, a motion from Mansour, second by Guinness. Call with a question by voice vote. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Guinness? Yes. Councilmember Mansour? Yes. Councilmember Marr? Yes. Councilmember Reynolds? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens? Yes. Mayor Foley? Yes. Okay. Motion carries 7 0. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rosales. Okay, we have two new business items tonight. The first is, uh, Ms. Green, you want to read the title? Item one, new business st strategic plan for the 2020 decennial census. Presentation by Mr. Ruiz, management aide. Thank you. Mr. Ruiz. Oh, you have to push the microphone on? There you go. Okay. Are you waiting for your, there you go. <clears throat> okay, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, Albert Ruiz here, um, ready to present an overview of the strategic plan for our 2020 decennial census. Um, I'd like to say that this is probably the best time um, with everyone um, being at home, uh, <laughs> self-isolating. Um, to take the census, uh, census questionnaires were mailed to every household um, beginning, and should have been received uh, as of May 12th, uh, last, th uh, last Thursday. March 12th. Yeah, March 12th. <laughs> um, again, I join you this evening to briefly discuss the background of the U.S. Census, past census efforts, and current action challenges, and to go over the census strategic plan. To begin, the U.S. Census Bureau has conducted a 10-year count of all residents of the United States since 1790 and every 10 years since. Uh, the questionnaire that is distributed to households across the nation is used to gather data used to assist with several endeavors, such as the constitutionally mandated determination of distribution of congressional seats to states and redistricting at the state and federal level. It also helps in planning decisions about where to provide community services, such as those for the elderly, building new roads and schools, and where to allocate funding for emergency services. Census data also informs how, to, how more than $675 billion in federal funding are distributed for public health, education, and transportation, among other projects and service areas. 
It is important to stress at this time that the data that is collected is protected under Title 13 of U.S. Code. Title 13 states that private information is never to be published or used against respondents or sent to any other government agency. Data is used purely for statistical purposes and census employees are sworn to protect respondents' information. Any violation will result in up to five years of jail time, a fine up to $250,000 or both. During the 2010 decennial census, City Hall became a questionnaire census center, which consisted of a table intermittently staffed by Census Bureau. This took place in the main lobby from mid-March to mid-April. Members of the community were encouraged to return completed questionnaires to this location and to seek assistance from staff when available. The city also posted census information and flyers to its website. In 2019, during the April 16th meeting, Council received a report by economic development staff regarding the 2020 census, wherein a draft outreach plan was presented. Council adopted Ordinance 1915 in support of the 2020 census and directed staff to pursue action to ensure a full and complete count. At the time, the draft outreach plan consisted of collaboration with Council, especially on outreach and meetings, partnerships with high schools and universities, and coordination with the city's public affairs manager and public information officer to get information posted and shared on several platforms. Since May of 2019, Constituent Services Team has co coordinated with our partners in the U.S. Census Bureau to form a complete count committee composed of members of state and federal offices, nonprofits, community-based organizations, utilities, the school district, local business, and faith-based communities. Staff has hosted several meetings over the year with our partners as well as at the city's temporary bridge shelter. When possible, census staff has been invited to table at events to disseminate information to the public, such as at the Hispanic Heritage Talk in October. In late February, a workshop was hosted with nonprofit partners to strategize for overcoming challenges to getting an accurate count. You will find the California State Association of Counties list of significant challenges to the 2020 census in attachment to page 13. And you can find these challenges above in the PowerPoint. Uh, the most significant challenge coming up in 2020 is access to hard to count populations. While the census is um, um, available to all, these hard to, hard to count populations are known as the least likely to respond. And they consist of individuals who are hard to locate, interview, persuade, and or contact. The following is a map of the concentration of hard to count groups in the city by census tract. A version of this map is included in attachment three, page 14. There are an estimated 62,331 residents in the city that reside in census tracts with an above average hard to count rate. The leading characteristics in these areas include renter occupied housing and multi-unit structures such as apartments. High concentrations of hard to count populations can be found in portions of most districts throughout the city. However, District 4 is the most impacted. It is imperative that these hard to count populations are reached to ensure the city is receiving its fair share of resources. Now on to the outreach plan. Given that all districts contain at least one census tract with low response from the hard to count, Staff will collaborate with council to identify trusted leaders to act as census ambassadors and to disseminate vital census information. As well, we will collaborate on messaging on a district by district basis, considering the characteristics specific to those tracks most, that are most impacted. Digital marketing, is especially, uh, especially given our current circumstances with COVID-19, is going to be our strongest approach until guidelines for public engagement change. Not only that, but um, this census for the first time is available online and it's the first of its nature given this format. So to prepare, um, staff has participated in more than 20 hours of digital marketing webinars and outreach to hard to count populations, census messaging and tools to use. In coordination with the city's public information officer and public affairs manager, 
Staff will be working to schedule posts on the city's social media accounts to the weekly city snapshot, as well as posting neighborhood specific material on the Nextdoor app in order to target those residing in hard to count census tracts and neighborhoods. An example of a city hall snapshot can be seen above in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, the image of this snapshot was a post from last November advertising job opportunities. Um, and most recently, the city featured a snapshot uh, with messaging to inform residents on the availability of the census and ways to take it. Staff will work with public affairs manager to develop language to use for Costa Mesa Minute, the week of important dates along the Bureau's outreach timeline. Staff will also work to create a splash page for the city's website that will host census information and link important resources and fact sheets. With the closure of schools across the state due to COVID-19, census partners are currently looking at ways to integrate promotion where possible. School-age children are considered hard to count, especially those under the age of five. While not especially hard to count in the city, it is still important that families are made aware and are able to complete the questionnaire. Another example of supporting the census is the census signature. Staff um, that are public facing can adopt to use this signature um, and utilize census themed uh, imagery. Uh, above we have a shape your future image. The signature will contain this, that contains this image will link to the Bureau's website so those that receive emails from staff uh, will have the opportunity to click on this link and be directed to the census website. Staff has also been working with the county to identify locations to act as questionnaire assistance centers and to promote funding for community-based organizations to use for outreach and marketing. The map above depicts a list of potential sites to act as these centers or kiosks, which would comprise of either a computer or device and staff on site to assist residents with questions. Donald Dungan and Mesa Verde Branch Libraries were once listed to, be ho to host this infrastructure. However, due to recent closures of county and city facilities, these plans will be revisited at a future time. Additionally, as attachment four depicts on pages 17 through 19, at one point staff was considering a first of its kind mobile marketing piece to be placed in highly trafficked, hard to count communities as a way to bring a kiosk directly to the residents. The image above is a mock rendering of what the kiosk would have looked like. It would host two sections with flyers and a fact sh uh, with fact sheets and in multiple languages, as well as mobile devices with preloaded slideshows and data for residents. However, again, given the changing circumstances regarding COVID-19, a piece like this would have to be considered at a later date. For reference, these maps above depict a side-by-side -side comparison with the identified assistance centers with hard-to-count census tracts. As you can see, the centers would be strategically located in areas directly or bordering hard to count areas. As we come to a close now, I would like to end briefly by going over key dates for the census. As of now, the census is still set for completion on July 31st. Last Thursday, March 12th, the census officially became available to take online. Questionnaires will, be, will have arrived to households between that day and March 20th. Reminders will be mailed to households periodically until July. And by late April, every household will have received four reminders by mail to complete the questionnaire. The above timeline is for the Get Out the Count action created by 270's Strategies, a marketing company leading collaborative campaign with 15 national groups and more than 30 states. Per this timeline, we are currently in the promotion and mobilization phase wherein efforts are aimed at encouraging households to fill out their mailed forms. Uh, as I close, I would like to emphasize that our community, to our community, that although our circumstances have changed due to COVID-19, the, the census questionnaire is vital for all to take. By now, every household in the city should have received a questionnaire and a 12-digit ID number via mail. Residents can use this ID number to fill out their physical questionnaire or they can elect to do so online or over the phone. The questionnaire is a snapshot of everyone where they are located at the time of the count. Regardless of whether you are a renter, temporary worker, or college student, everybody counts. The questionnaire and assistance are available in multiple languages, online and over the phone. 
And at this time, I am available to take any comments or suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Great report. Uh, are there any questions from the council? If so, request the floor. Hearing no one, uh, we will open this item up for public comment. Seeing no one, close the public comment. Uh, <laughs> Madam so, Mayor. Uh, Sorry, excuse me, Madam yes. Mayor, and we have oh, received gosh. no comments. I did from it the again. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'll get it. Um, we have no comments from the public. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so we, ha uh, I'll make the motion to receive and file the 2020 Census Strategic Plan. And, uh, Madam Mayor, I'll second. Okay, I wasn't done, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and, and if there are any other, um, any other methods that anyone thinks that we should consider, please suggest them. I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Mr. Ruiz. I know it's such a bummer. You've worked so hard on this. I know you had many community meetings and you got a lot of people working. You worked on that kiosk and, um, you know, another consequence of COVID-19. <laughs> but you've been great at being flexible and adjusting. So thank you so much for all the hard work that you've done to get us here. I got my census form in the mail. Council members, did everyone get their form? Council member yep. Guinness? Yes. Council member Monsoor, did you get your form? I'm ready to vote on this and go home. Yep. All right. I just wanted to say, I, I, I mean, I know how it is. You worked so hard on this, and then events conspired. And um, I'm really appreciative that you're trying to think of ways to to respond to the immediate circumstances, which you never would have expected. And, and that's for all of our staff too on so many things. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else who would wish to make comment? Uh, Madam Mayor, I would. Councilmember Chavez. Yes, Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Ruiz, for your great presentation. Um, this, I'm very proud. I'm very proud and excited for this um, this information to be dispersed to the community. When I first was elected, one of the first things I spoke with Tammy, our then city manager, was actually about the census track. Um, at the time, I wanted to get more funding for our projects here locally, like park expansions and things of that nature, but. Now, given the dire straits of COVID-19, it's just a matter of getting everyone counted to get more money in general. Um, but overall, I think this is an amazing plan. Um, I, like the, I like the idea of including in the school district and the faith groups. You know, we should be going into areas that people um, are more comfortable and trust, and this plan does that. Um, I'm hoping that with us being in self-isolation these next couple of weeks, people will start doing the census. Uh, I did mine today with my parents and, and my sister. It was a good way to show her the importance of um, answering the census and what it means for her and, and for everyone in the community. So um, overall, this is amazing, and I feel very happy what we're voting for today. Thank you. Any other comments, Council? Okay, hearing no one, the one important piece of this and why everyone should fill out their census is this situation that we're in right now. If we can get a good count, we might be able to get some additional funding that'll make up for some of our losses. Okay, call for the question. Okay, thank you. Council Member Chavez. Yeah. Council Member Guinness. Yes. Council Member Mansour. Yes. Council Member Marr. Yes. Council Member Reynolds. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Yes. Mayor Foley. Yes. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Okay. Madam Mayor, while um, our emergency services manager comes up uh, on the final item, um, I did want to add something if, if it's all right. Um, I sent it out to the council, but I thought it would be helpful to the public and maybe ease some minds if I announced uh, that the CPUC, uh, which is the Public Utilities Commission for the state, uh, issued an order today uh, determining that the, there would be no customer disconnections for non-payment um, for energy, water, sewer, and communications companies uh, where the cause for non-payment uh, is as a result of someone being unable to report to work due to illness, quarantine, or social distancing. Hopefully that will ease some minds in the community. 
Thank you. And are we going to put that on our website? Yes, we'll make okay. sure that's up. All right. Great. Mr. Dempsey, welcome. Thank you. I'll read the title. Thank you. Introduce for first reading an ordinance titled An Ordinance of the City Council of the City of Costa Mesa, California, amending Chapter 1 in general of Title VI, Disaster Relief and Civil Defense of the Costa Mesa and Mesa Code relating to emergency preparedness, organization, and coordination. And presentation by Mr. Dempsey, Emergency Services Administrator. Mr. Dempsey. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, City Manager. So what I'm bringing to you today, uh, we've discussed it before, but it is an attempt to update our existing municipal code as it relates to um, preparing for an emergency and having in place some of the basic structure that helped the city plan and prepare for one um, before it takes place. I tried to be somewhat conservative in how I went through it. Um, as opposed to there's, there's a lot of variety of, of what's out there. Um, so we stayed with what's best practice throughout the state of California. You'd be surprised at how much, or maybe not, how much it varies as you go north to south in the state. Um, most of the municipal code that's out there in this particular section, just like most other places in California, is actually a copy and paste, ma'am. Hold on, I'm sorry. We are currently, we're on item, Okay, because the ordinance is number three. Okay, I apologize. Because do we not have item three? Did we already do three? It doesn't show item three in here. That was an emergency ordinance. I understand. I'm asking. Okay, because it's in my packet here. That's why I'm asking. To, to clarify, we did adopt the emergency ordinance at your um, emergency meeting last Friday. So the item before you tonight is just the regular version of the ordinance, and we did distribute an updated version of that um, because of some changes we made as a result of re-reviewing okay. the model ordinance. So the reason I'm confused is because my new business item number two staff report is adopt proclamation declaring emergency ordinance. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mansour, I don't need it. I have it right oh, here. That's I have. What I was asking. I didn't know. Yeah, I okay. I got it. Thank you. Appreciate your input. Mr. Dempsey. So the goal is to update this, uh, our, our municipal code as it relates to this. Um, the existing code is approximately 40 years old. It's a copy and paste from a California Office of Emergency Services document. Um, so a lot of the language in there is even antiquated and as we look throughout this, uh, the state at the different jurisdictions at the local and the county level, um, there's been updates continuously and when we look at the updates that have taken place in the last 10, 15 years, um, much of them change many of the issues that we're looking to address, uh, address in the version that I, I provided to you. Um, so as we go through it, Essentially, what I'm looking at is to, to modernize what we have uh, and be a little bit more specific in our municipal code as we uh, prepare, respond, and recover to different types of events that can happen. Um, there's also some adjustments to the Disaster Council, and that's actually a pretty significant one and one that I wanted to mention to you, Madam Mayor, as uh, there's something in there that uh, refers to your, your status within the city. and. So you're aware the idea of the Disaster Council is not, it's not at the local level, it's not how the city responds to the disaster because as our elected leader, um, we would still take direction from our elected officials regardless. This is more, if we look at the powers and duties in 6-4, it's more related to the Disaster Council being a planning element that produces products that ultimately will come before you and the city council for your approval anyways. Um, so it's sort of essentially the, the senior staff in the city getting together and producing those products. As these are getting created, a lot of times the demands on these, the disaster council will be weekly meetings. For instance, for the, the local hazard mitigation plan being an example. Um, as 
we figure out what the, the update is to this municipal code, it would also include the emergency operations plan and other things. Um, going further into the municipal code, it, we also wanted to be a little bit more explicit in specifying how often we have a meeting. Since our city manager um, has been very proactive in helping us uh, embrace emergency management, management within the city, we've actually been exceeding the requirement that I listed in 6-4, which is to have at least one meeting every three months. Um, going down further, we look at the Director of Emergency Services. This position is one that's identified in the California Emergency Services Act, so we are just aligning with uh, that particular act. In some cities, so in the original language of this, the city manager is the director of emergency services. In other jurisdictions, they actually have it um, as the emergency manager. So rather than go to that extreme, um, we had some discussion and we looked at other models that exist out there in other jurisdictions and it seemed like a more prudent um, take was to have the emergency manager as the assistant director of emergency services. So I would act as her second. One of the challenges, even in this current situation where we're looking to address some of the things with COVID-19, is my particular position is several levels down within one of the city departments, and I'm working with people that structurally are, are much higher in the city hierarchy than me, and essentially directing them to do things that I would not otherwise have the authority to do. Um, so that's pretty significant for us. The remainder of it is mostly just clarifying that language and just making sure that um, that whatever, whatever the Director of Emergency Services is not able to do um, due to that individual's absence or inability to perform those duties, that I can do that and provide those recommendations to the City Council so that you can then decide what you wish to do with that information. And as you look through, especially in the red line copy, you'll notice that the remainder of it's pretty much uh, you know, minor, grammatical, uh, gender neutral type stuff. So I'm free to answer any questions or provide any additional information you may need, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, Council, if there are any questions, please ask for the floor by voice. Councilmember Reynolds. Councilmember Reynolds. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Dempsey, thank you for your report. I wish I could see you. I was a 10 minute delay, so you're still talking in the screen that I'm looking at. Um, I, uh, I wanna make sure I understand your report um, you had described, I think, that you you recommend that the disaster council leadership be structured a little bit differently than in our staff report. Yes, ma'am. So that could you describe that again, please? Or I'll tell you. What can what you? I I'm sorry, it's kind of fuzzy in your. I can't. What was your? Could you repeat your question? Yeah, I'm trying to understand the, um, the presentation. So I, what I think I heard Mr. Dempsey describe um, was a, a recommendation that the um, chair of the council be the director of emergency services and the vice chair be the assistant director of emergency services and that this council, this disaster council, develops recommendations for the city council. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? Ask for the floor, please. Okay, would anyone? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I, this is John. Okay, so, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, the if if the mayor if the mayor is the chair the chair, and I, I do think it's it's good that we have a city council member on the disaster council but if the mayor is the chair i mean how does that affect the chain of command and like what role would the chair have on the disaster council i, I it, it's unclear to me what what the significance of a of a chair as opposed to the director of the council uh, i could respond to that uh, the chair simply would would manage and run the meetings and would have the power to call meetings um, the director of emergency services would remain the city manager. And Ms. Barlow, the we already had a disaster council before we took action on Friday, right? Correct. Okay, and 
the mayor was on the disaster council, but the mayor didn't do anything regarding developing plans, operational procedures, anything like that, right? In theory, that's what the disaster council is for, but as far as I know, the mayor has never met with the disaster council. That, but that's not my question, because but, I did the research on all the, the neighboring cities, mm -hmm. and all the neighboring cities have this same kind of a format, and so I would expect that Certainly, anybody who's the mayor is not qualified to create a disaster plan. So, <laughs> um, so that unless they are Jason Dempsey, who is now a mayor somewhere, <laughs> um, or Lorianne Farrell Harrison, who is now a mayor somewhere. Yeah, that is um, one of the functions of the Des disaster council. But and the model ordinance does contain mayor. I think uh, Mr. Dempsey has a different recommendation, but that is the. You're right. The, it is part of the existing regular ordinance and um, the model ordinance from the OES. So so just to address Mr. Dempsey's recommendation, um, because the recommendation from Mr. Dempsey also is to include, not to include a representative from the city council, but to include somebody from civic, business, labor, veterans, professional, other organizations. So. So that seems odd to me that you would exclude somebody from the voice of the city council, but you would include some random business person. So that's my concern. Is there a way that we can craft some language in here to clarify so that everybody is clear that the mayor's not in charge of developing the plan, because I hear that that's the concern. So is there a way to craft some language? If, if I could, um, yeah. Madam Mayor. Clarify. Uh, one of the, if I could clarify, uh, one of the things, one of the examples we could use is, so first off, if I could, the, the civic business leader veterans group, that's actually in the existing language, so I left it there. And um, I probably should have been more sensitive. That doesn't help. I, no, I understand. <laughs> I probably should have been more uh, conscious of that as I presented this to you. Um, what I will say is that Laguna and uh, Laguna Hills and Liso Viejo, the mayor's actually a member of the disaster council, but rather than being the chair, they're an ex officio member. Um, so they sit in there at their pleasure and are privy to all the information and all the processes. But obviously, that um, those individuals can't necessarily be there all the time. But then the meeting can go on without that sure. person necessarily needing to call it. So perhaps that's an option that could be considered as well. Yeah, I think it's just so that the council has a voice, on, just like yes, a civic my, member. And my intent was never to, to try to push the elected officials out. It was merely to ensure that the process was streamlined and that within our side, as um, the city staff, that we don't use that as an excuse to not move forward because our mayor's got a busy schedule. Well, that's never happened around here, but... <laughs> uh, 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 Councilman McGinnis. Whether or not the mayor's on there, or any council member on there, does that affect whether or not this is a Brown Act thing where you have to post and all that, or, or is that moot? Uh, no, any, any meeting, uh, any standing body that is uh, approved and, and made public by the city council is technically a Brown Act meeting. Typically, we would have these meetings in closed session when we're discussing emergency management issues. So even though they're, they're, they're Brown Act bodies, regardless of whether the, there's a mayor or an elected on there, in practice, they would meet the, typically meet the exception of a closed session. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you could come up, we're gonna finish the questions. If you could come up with some language that would address that. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, okay, so any other questions? by council. Okay, we'll close public comment. Council, is there a motion? Could we have public yeah. comments? Oh, I'll I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. Ms. Green, please read the public comments. Thank you, we do have one public comment that was texted in is, Costa, it relates to the, the situation. Is Costa Mesa in a shelter in place situation? We are not. That's not, on. That's, not, that's not related, but that's okay. They texted in and that's part of what we're doing here. We are not, and there has been a, we'll probably update this at, after this item. We can update everybody on what the Orange County Public Health has uh, 
the order that they have issued and then clarified. Okay. Which um, be different tomorrow. Okay, no more public comment. Council, I'll close public comment. Is there a motion? Mayor Pro Tem Actually, Stevens. Mayor, may I? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, hold on. Ms. I Ma hold on, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. Ms. Farrell Harrison had a comment. So um, I'm a little confused, and I think part of the confusion is because we have two versions of the ordinance. There was the version from last week and the version from this week. And so I think um, I want to point us to se section 6.4, which is the Disaster Council Powers and Duties as we deliberate as to the structure of the, count of the Disaster Council and its composition, the roles of the people that are on the Disaster Council, and the, the um, powers and the duties of the Disaster Council are about emergency and mutual aid plans and agreements and such ordinances and resolutions and rules and regulations as are necessary to implement such plans and agreements. So it's about emergency, and mutual aid plans. And so I think with that in mind, we should be looking at the composition of the disaster council membership and see um, you know, what makes sense in a rapidly evolving situation and um, in an emergency like the one that we're in right now. So I would just offer that as well for additional consideration. And I think Mr. Dempsey was offering an ex officio uh, position for a member the mayor or their designee from the city council. Uh, mayor Pro right. Tim Stevens. Yeah, that that's basically what uh, uh, Mayor Foley said is my motion, which is you um, have the mayor or the mayor's designee be an ex officio member of the disaster council, but the chair is the uh, director of emergency services. The assistant chair is the assistant directory of emergency services and everything else remains the same from what was in our original staff report. Okay. Is there a second? Second, Reynolds. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Please request the floor. Okay. Hearing no one, call for the question by voice vote. Thank you. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Guinness? Councilmember Mansour? Yes. Councilmember Marr? Yes. Councilmember Reynolds? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens? Yes. Mayor Foley? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Okay. And we have no, are there any other further? Oh, here. This is where I would like to give an update. I would encourage everyone to go to the city website. The Orange County Public Health Department has issued an order, and that order has then since been clarified. We are not in a, what is the phrase? Shelter, shelter at home situation. However, there are uh, advisements as to uh, staying at home and what kinds of businesses will no longer be allowed to be open, such as bars, nightclubs, um, movie theaters, and the like. And so please go to the city website and read the order as well as read the clarifying order from the Orange County Public Health. We have those links on the city website. And... Um, Thanks to everyone again, and hopefully we can all get through this. Yes, I, I got it. Any other council comments? Keep calm and carry on. Okay. Okay. At this time, I will adjourn the meeting in recognition of uh, one of our former employees, We Fam, and. You know, St. Patrick's Day, I'm Irish. I didn't even wear my green tonight, which I'm ashamed of. Um, but we seem to have these life-changing incidents that happen on St. Patrick's Day. So we'll adjourn our meeting in honor of We Fam, a 29-year-old maintenance worker who'd been with our city um, and who uh, committed suicide and off of the city building. We also want to pay respect to the two employee witnesses who witnessed his, um, you know, his death. So, um, and blessings to his family. Thank you.